This video provides you with an introduction into the arbitrage pricing theory. And it also talks about the similarities and differences to the cap M. So the arbitrage pricing theory, or in short, APT, is an empirical way to derive a cap M like security market line. Now, in order to do that, the APT requires three assumptions. Assumption one, all asset returns follow a linear factor model. Assumption two, there are sufficiently many assets to invest into such that asset specific risk can be diversified away. Assumption three, asset markets are arbitrage free. So Stephen Ross, the inventor of the APT, has shown that if these three assumptions hold, then expected asset returns of well-diversified portfolios increase linearly with the amount of systematic risk. Graphically, it means that expected returns, which we call mu, of well-diversified assets line up on such a security market line. So let's talk about the intuition of the APT. In order to keep notation at a minimum, we pretend that a systematic risk factor, capital F, was one dimensional. So assumption one of the APT implies that a portfolio made up of capital N assets follows a linear factor model itself. So let's look at that based on some equations. Equation one says that the return of the portfolio minus the expected return is the beta of the portfolio times F plus epsilon P. And the variance of epsilon p is sigma square epsilon p. Now the expected return of the portfolio is simply the linear combination of expected returns of individual assets times wi, which reflects the relative weight of asset i in the portfolio. Now beta p is also the weighted average of individual betas. Sigma square p, so the total variance of the portfolio return, has two components. One is beta square p times the variance of the factor return plus sigma square epsilon p. And sigma square epsilon p is the linear combination of asset specific risk sigma square epsilon i weighted by w i squared where again w i is the relative weight that asset i has in the portfolio now this last equation holds because epsilon i is orthogonal to epsilon j these are firm specific shocks now assumption two of the apt implies that n, the number of assets in the portfolio, is sufficiently large so that we can say that the variance of epsilon p goes to zero. It's easy to visualize that last claim for the equal weight portfolio. Because for the equal weight portfolio, the weight is one over n, so sigma square epsilon p will be the sum from i equal 1 to n of 1 over n square times sigma square epsilon i, which will coincide with 1 over n times the average idiosyncratic risk. And that term goes to zero if the number of assets n goes to infinity. So as a well-diversified portfolio is not affected by asset specific return shocks, we can indeed say that for all practical purposes, 
a well-diversified portfolio has the following factor structure, which would imply that the return of a portfolio, to be precise, the return of a well-diversified portfolio, equals the expected return plus beta p times the factor. Now let's visualize that with a graph. The x-axis displays the realized value of the factor f, whereas the y-axis displays the realized return of a well-diversified portfolio. If f was zero, the portfolio would earn its expected return. Now, as f deviates from its expectation, the realized return on the portfolio also deviates from its expectation. And the slope of the relationship is controlled by the asset's factor sensitivity. Assumption 3 of the APT ensures that market prices of all N assets are free of arbitrage. This says that two well-diversified portfolios with the same beta and hence the same risk must be priced with the same risk premium. Otherwise, one could create a long-short portfolio where the portfolio with the lower expected risk premium, hence the higher price, is shorted and the portfolio with the higher expected risk premium hence the lower price is bought. Such a long short trade would earn the spread of both risk premiums without any variance. So as arbitrage is ruled out by assumption, it means prices adjust freely so that diversified portfolios with the same factor exposure do also pay the same expected risk premium. And that insight just coincides with a security market line for well-diversified portfolios. So notice in the graph we plot the factor sensitivity on the x-axis and the expected portfolio return on the y-axis. A portfolio with a zero beta pays the risk-free rate. The slope of that security market line coincides with the expected risk premium of the systematic risk factor. And notice, if you choose the factor to coincide with Rm minus the expectation of Rm, then you get for the expected return of a well-diversified portfolio that the expected return of that well-diversified portfolio is the risk-free rate plus the beta of the portfolio times the expected risk premium of the market. And that last expression coincides with the CAPM implied security market line here applied to a portfolio. So let's step back and ask what have we just accomplished? Well, we've detected a second way to derive a security market line. The cap M derives the security market line based on mean variance portfolio optimizing investors. The APT derives the security market line based on no arbitrage and based on having a portfolio with many assets where each asset return follows a linear factor model. For practical work, the APT says that capital M doesn't need to be the market portfolio. It suffices if it's a well-diversified portfolio. And for the APT, the security market line exists 
only, only, I highlight only, for well diversified portfolios. While the cap M derives a security market line for individual securities. That is one key difference. Now Steve Ross showed that a security market line exists if the APT holds for most individual securities. I highlight for most, but he couldn't show that it holds for all. While when you go back to the cap M derivation, you see that the security market line, if you work with the stronger assumptions of the cap M, holds for every single asset. Now also of interest is that Chen, Roll and Ross in 1986 have proposed a five factor APT with which gained some traction in the literature and which reads as follows. Now here, IP stands for the percentage surprise move in industrial production. EI is the percentage surprise move in expected inflation. UI is the percentage surprise move in realized inflation. CG is the long maturity corporate bond spread relative to treasuries and GB is the slope of the treasury yield curve. Notice that later in the course we will talk about the Farmer Macbeth approach for estimating such factor premiums. Another prominent APT factor model is the Farmer French three factor model from 1993. It reads as follows, where RSMB is the excess return of a portfolio that is long small stocks and short large stocks. The term RHML is the excess return of a long short strategy that goes short growth firms and long value firms. Notice here as these factors are excess returns, the sample average is often used as a measure for the expected factor premium. Now, I want to end that video here with a question. Is the APT a multi-index cap M? Or is it from an economic perspective something different? Now let me also answer that question. First, the APT is not a multi-index cap M. A multi-index cap M, better known as Merton's intertemporal cap M, is the result from a multi-period portfolio selection process, where asset returns are non-Gaussian and where the marginal investor wants to hatch unexpected variations in the level and slope of the capital allocation line. Assets that are better in hatching these changes in the capital allocation line are more attractive to a marginal investor whose risk aversion is larger than log utility. The price of such assets is bid up which implies lower priced in risk premiums. Sometimes you hear that such assets are priced in with a negative hedge premium. So in the intertemporal cap M, all factors on top of the market excess return arise from a particular hedging motive. Now in contrast, Factors in the APT are proxies for systematic risk in the economy. Now, economically speaking, that is a very different channel, even though both linear factor models could look the same. 
from a statistical point of view.